Hello, my name is Colette Quinn, and I'm a scientist at TA Instruments Waters Corporation. Thanks for joining our webinar today. If you experience any problems, please refer back to the message that was sent regarding the webinar on login issues. If you have any questions during the webinar, please click on the question mark widget located at the bottom of your screen. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Larry Krauss. Larry Krauss is a foremost expert in battery technology with his career starting at Argonne National Labs and then leading to a position at 3M which he held for over 30 years doing extensive battery research. Larry recently co-founded the company Cyclical where he continues to do battery research focusing on lithium ion and lithium technologies. Larry? Well thanks a lot Colette for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk today about isothermal heat flow calorimetry, uh, specifically as it's applied to batteries. Um, I worked at 3M for 36 years. About 30 years of that was in uh, materials development for lithium ion batteries. And last September I retired and co-founded an uh, experimental consulting company, Cyclical LLC, and we specialize in uh, high precision measurements for lithium ion batteries specifically meant to develop advanced electrolytes for lithium ion chemistry, for lithium ion batteries. And uh, we tend to focus on techniques that are not ordinarily available, like uh, high precision colometry. The technique I'm gonna talk about today, which is uh, isothermal heat flow calorimetry. And we've also added uh, accelerated rate calorimetry to study uh, thermal runaway in batteries as well. So, um, the major focus of this, the takeaway at the end of the day, should be that you get an understanding for what heat is measured when you're applying this technique to a battery. What are the sources of that heat from, from basic uh, thermodynamic considerations? And then how to separate those sources of heat. And most importantly, what we're after is the irreversible reactions that take place in a battery. And most of this is going to be focused towards a lithium ion battery we're going to be searching for the parasitic cell reactions, the secondary cell reactions in the lithium ion battery that rob the battery of capacity, degrade its calendar life, and uh, degrade its shelf life, for example. And uh, these are very, very important issues right now in lithium ion chemistry as they will, ultimately they're, they're tied to the reactions between the electrodes and the, electro and the electrolytes. So uh, ferreting these out and understanding them and developing new electrolytes sheds light on the, on the um, applicability of isothermal heat flow calorimetry to solving these problems. Okay, so at the end of the, end of the talk, hopefully you've got a better understanding, a better appreciation for uh, what microcalorimetry can do in the measurement of a, of a, of a battery. Okay, this, this shows you the basic, uh, the basic subjects I want to cover, first of all, uh, the basic opera operation of a conduction calorimeter, um, some operational issues in the TAM-3. We have a TAM-3, setting a baseline uh, calibration procedures that we use, and equipment modifications that we employed when we, when we first got the TAM-3. The equipment modifications were done so that we could actually uh, do electrochemical measurements on the battery while the battery is sitting in the calorimeter. Then we'll move to the fundamental parameters governing uh, sources of heat flow, and then go into some subjects uh, um, related to the more recent methods for extracting, extracting reaction parasitics. It's largely about lithium ion electrolyte chemistry. Uh, we're gonna talk about full cells, full, real, uh, bona fide um, uh, lithium ion batteries, the effective state of charge of a lithium ion battery on the parasitics, and then talk a little bit about the use of symmetric cells in this area as well. All right, first of all, basic operation of a conduction calorimetry, which is synonymous to an isothermal heat flow calorimeter. Um, okay, so on the right here, you see a, uh, a little cartoon of a um, conduction calorimeter. The left compartment here is the measuring compartment, so your battery would sit in this compartment, but for these purposes, it's just represented as a resistor. And we're gonna apply a constant current to that resistor, measure the resistance, measure the voltage drop across that resistor, and by the product of the um, current times the voltage, we'll get the thermal power applied to the left side of this uh, hypothetical heat flow calorimeter. 
So the heat is generated in the left. Well, I, I should note that the other major parts of the calorimeter are uh, detectors, which are thermoelectric devices here represented as a thermal pile. And this whole measuring apparatus as well as um, the whole uh, sample compartment as well as the measuring devices sit in a constant temperature source. That could be an air source, it could be a water bath, or in the case of a, of a TAM-3 or a TAM-4, a, uh, a highly precise oil bath. So heat is generated in the left-hand compartment, and that, that heat flux will represent as H, and it's a constant. But there's also a heat flux across the thermal pile, which is H sub T, and here's the thermal pile. So there's, there's heat moving from this side of the calorimeter across that thermal pile. So overall, with respect to time, the left compartment will eventually reach a steady state uh, flux given by this equation. H, the heat flux from the sample compartment, is equal to the heat flux across the thermal pile, plus the heat capacity of the uh, left side compartment, its, con its contents and its surroundings, multiplied by the change in temperature divided by uh, uh, the change in time. So when the temperature become constant, uh, D, this, this derivative, dt, dt, becomes zero, and then the heat flux um, from the measuring compartment across the thermal pile is a constant. <coughs> and uh, that results in a voltage difference across the thermoelectric, which is then correlated to a, uh, a, uh, <coughs> a heat flow in, uh, say, for example, microwatts or watts, or watts depending upon the sensitivity of the, of the system. So there exists a temperature gradient across the thermal pile at all times as, as, as heat is being generated in the left compartment. So that's basically how a uh, conduction calorimeter works. All right, some operational issues, uh, setting a baseline calibration position, uh, procedure and equipment modifications of a TAM-3. So as I said, we have a TAM-3 and it's shown here. Uh, this is basically a um, college dormitory sized refrigerator the oil bath sits underneath some of the uh, controls on the top. Um, we have 12 calorimeters in this device, 12 uh, 20 milliliter mi uh, micro calorimeters. And you can see three in this cluster here. There's three over here, three here, and three here. And what we always do in this is we apply electrochemical measurements to the cells that we're measuring. And to do that, we use uh, highly precise 20, Keithley 2602A current volt source meters, which are over here. We have six of these just driving the TAM. And uh, each one of these has two channels, so we have a total of 12 cells that we can cycle simultaneously or do electrochemical measurements simultaneously. Um, so that's what the TAM looks like. Uh, equipment modifications. The modifications we did have to are concerned with the lifter. So this whole thing here is a lifter. And if you go back, you know, you can see the black cap on top. And uh, backing up one, you can see the black top <coughs> over here. So the lifter fits down inside of this um, calorimeter shaft. And uh, <coughs> what we had to do in order to put wires down there to connect into the battery, we had to put a couple, we put one hole in the top of the lifter cap and ran wire down the middle, two holes on the main thermal shunt here and then holes for extending the wires down through this shunt, this shunt, all the way down to the sample holder here where the battery sits inside of this um, stainless steel uh, sample holder. Uh, initially, or, or well, uh, yeah, initially we used um, uh, 32 gauge, 32 AWG copper phosphor bronze wires uh, to uh, wire our battery externally. And we did this because this wire, which we get from Lakeshore, uh, cryogenics is very good for, uh, it has very low thermal conductivity, so it, it's, it's used to ensure that there's no heat flow, uh, no aggravated or excessive heat flow in and out of the calorimeter by virtue of the modifications that we did. Important part about this procedure was um, sealing the holes that you put in the, in the shunts. So um, when we first did this, we, we really didn't adequately seal the holes we put in this main uh, thermal shunt at the top, and for, for some time, you know, we thought we had them sealed, but for some time, uh, we had destroyed the initial baseline that the instrument came with. So the instrument had a very precise baseline, but once we did our thing with it, the baseline was much, much worse. So um, 
to make a long story short, what we found was is uh, any time a piece of HVAC equipment would come on, or even when somebody walked in the door in the room, we would see this perturbation of the baseline. And what turned out to be is that we did not seal this shunt very well. The sealants that we used did not adhere to the stainless steel surface very well, so we moved to a different type of a sealant. We now use a tor seal, which is an epoxy embedded, highly embedded with uh, or impregnated with uh, inorganics. And that uh, wets the surface of the stainless steel very well, and it makes a wonderful seal, and we resolved our baseline issues and returned to the, to the um, noise level that the instrument came, from, came with. So we use a four-wire configuration, uh, four wires so that we can compensate for the voltage drop when we apply current, and then two wires for current carrying. Um, that worked very well, and I'll show you the baseline data that we acquire with this, but <clears throat> initially on we were using um, uh, coin cells, and coin cells are, you know, one to three milliamp hours, so small. And the currents we apply for a, a coin cell are, are usually well under a milliamp. And this work, this configuration with the, um, with the uh, uh, 32AWG copper phosphor bronze wire worked quite well. But we moved to much larger cells, so now we use cells that are in the range of 250 to 300 milliamp hours. And the currents we need to run these things now are at 20 milliamps. And so when we used the copper phosphor bronze connections to do that with the 20 milliamp applied currents, our calibration curves, our calibration constants were, were, were seriously in error. Uh, again, making a long story short, the 32AWG copper phosphor bronze wire was not able to carry the 20 milliamps without self-heating. So while we're compensating for the voltage drop, we were not, and, and we were unable to compensate for the excess heat that was generated by passing 20 milliamps through these very, very thin wires. So to solve that, what we had to do was make a junction just under this second thermal shunt where we connected an 18 gauge copper wire to the 32 AWG wire and ran that down into the sample holder and connect it to the battery. So now we have the four wire 32 AWG coming down through the second thermal shunt and then the current carrying wires become 18 gauge copper wire down to the sample holder soldered to the battery and our, um, our, our voltage sense leads are still the 32 AWG and that worked quite well. And that's all kind of indicated here. Two copper phosphor bronze wires for sense wires and two 18 gauge current carrying leads to eliminate intrinsic resistive heating at higher currents. So you have to be very careful of that. You have to very carefully check the, the calibration and baseline after you're done um, um, doing any modifications. All right, uh, calibration and baseline setting. So this is a very important part of setting up the experiment. And although the TAM3 comes with uh, TAM Assistant, and TAM Assistant gives you a capability of calibrating and setting a baseline internally. What I'm going to describe is much, much better to do than using the internal calibration that, that the TAM Assistant uh, gives you. And the, point, and the reason for that is you want to keep the calibration and the test cell that you're going to do to do this, to have it as close as possible in heat capacity, in thermal conductivity, and in heat transfer coefficients to the actual measurement you're going to make. Any deviation from that is, 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 is not desirable. So in that vein, what we started out doing is we would make, uh, we, we made our own test cells. In the beginning, as I said, we were using coin cells, and so our test cell was a coin cell in which we embedded a resistor inside the coin cell. It had the electrodes in it. Um, it was sealed in an identical fashion to the uh, real ba batteries we were going to be measuring, but it had no electrolyte. So we have this coin cell with an embedded resistor, in which we know that resistor, and this we used for setting our baseline. So typically we would attach our calibration cell to that, uh, put it in the calorimeter, and then often we would just watch the stability of the baseline for long periods of time. And you can see here that uh, in, this, in this case, for almost 200 hours, the baseline is completely flat. 
Um, and the noise level is well under a microwatt. So very good, very stable baseline. And using that same calibration test cell, uh, which has the resistor in it, and we know that resistance value, we can apply a current to that test resistor. We do and then do our calibrations using that test cell. So for example, we'll apply a certain current to that resistor. We'll set our baseline, set the offset of the, uh, set the gain of the instrument using that heat flow measurement that we're measuring. And then we'll run several currents, a number of currents around that value to check the fidelity of that calibration constant. And you can see here that it's a perfect straight line. So that's how we do our baseline and calibration setting before we actually measure a battery. And um, it, it works quite well. And for the larger test cells, we do the very same thing. So typically we'll measure um, bag cell, bag lithium ion pouch cells, something kind of like a cell phone battery. And we'll take one of those batteries without electrolyte in it and we'll embed resistors and repeat the same type of procedure, making a test cell that faithfully mimics all the physical characteristics of the real battery as close as we can. All right, so that's calibration and uh, uh, baseline setting. All right, so now we should go into the fundamental parameters governing sources of heat flow. So that you, you put the battery in it and heat will be measured and you wonder, well, where, all, where is all that heat coming from? What's the sources of that heat? So this is the part that tries to give you some basic understanding of that. All right, so batteries are chemical thermodynamic systems, and if you consider any arbitrary reaction, uh, for example, one shown here, A plus B goes to AB, this is where the energy is stored in the battery, and it's the energy we're gonna use to produce work, either drive a motor, heat a resistor, whatever. Uh, from the first law of thermodynamics, the total change in the internal energy of the system is equal to the heat minus the work. So W is work that can be done with the energy stored in the battery, and Q is the heat. And for now, I'm going to talk just about a reversible, hypothetically reversible process, a thermodynamically reversible process. Uh, in any battery, if you charge or discharge it, there's always a component of work and heat, always. So the change in the free energy of the system is always a combination of work and heat. You have to have both. Um, so since we're talking about a battery, uh, the work external appears external, all right? So we're gonna hook this battery up, the wires come out of the calorimeter, it's hooked to a cycler, a charge or discharge or a resistor or whatever. All that work is being done outside of the calorimeter and we don't measure that work. Um, Q, however, in our case is, uh, well, backing up a second, since we're talking about the battery, work appears externally to the battery, in our case, external to the calorimeter, okay? That's a, uh, somewhat obvious for most people, but um, for those that aren't, that that's, needs to be understood. In the special case of a reversible process, there is a minimum amount of thermal energy which will appear in the cell, and therefore the calorimeter. So switching to the Gibbs equation for free energy, delta G, of course, is the free energy. It's equal to the reaction enthalpy, delta H, minus the term temperature times the change in entropy. So delta G now is the available reversible electrical work. It comes outside of the calorimeter. Delta H is the reaction enthalpy. And T delta S is the entropic term. Um, and you can see from this equation that <coughs> delta G is always less than delta H. The reversible work that you can get out of a system is always less than the reaction enthalpy. So the quantity T delta S is the minimum amount of heat produced in the cell measured by the calorimeter when the process is charging or discharging in a reversible manner. So at a minimum, your calorimeter will measure T delta S. Okay, so that's one component is an entropy change. And the value of that can change. It can be large or it, could, or it can be minuscule, very, very small. In some cases, it can be ignored. And depending upon how you do the experiment, you can set it up so you can say to yourself, okay, I think I can ignore the entropy term. But fundamentally and rigorously, that's what's there is the reaction enthalpy. I'm sorry, entropy. Okay, so however, discharging a battery is never really done reversibly under any practical condition. One of the major contributors to forcing a system to be non-reversible is the cell's internal resistance. So I went into this talking about a reversible system. 
and uh, <clears throat> that's a hypothetical, idealized case, but now we're going to talk about what really can happen when you're doing any electrochemical measurements on the system. Uh, one of the major contributors to, the force is, to forcing a system to be non-reversible is the cell's internal resistance, as I just said. So all battery electrolytes have resistance to ionic conduction, and here's a list of uh, some of the sources of internal resistance to the battery. There's the electrolyte conductivity. Every battery electrolyte has some resistance to the flow of ions in the electrolyte. The anode and cathode electrical resistance. A lot of batteries have coatings that represent the anode or the cathode, and these um, coatings are mixtures of carbon and active materials, and the coatings have to be able to conduct electrons through the coating via the carbon that is generally in the coating, and then be collected at a current collector, so that's almost like a wire. You have the flow of electrons through the, uh, through the coatings. That's a source of resistance. Concentration gradients, as you pass current in a, in a battery, depending on the magnitude of it, you can develop a concentration gradient in the uh, electrolyte or in the anode cathode coatings or indeed even in the particles. And uh, also uh, passivation layers, um, things that are created by virtue of charging and discharging a cell, passive layers on the surface of the active particles, can also be a source of resistances in the cell. Okay, uh, so in the case of a true resistor, now when we pass current through this cell, heat's going to be generated. So in addition to the minimum T delta S contribution, we have to add the heat formed by the passage of current in the cell. So running current through the cell produces heat that you measure in the calorimeter. So now we have T delta S term, and now we have the heat generated from passing current. So W sub cal represents the thermal power that we're measuring in the calorimeter. Here's our T delta S term, and we're converting this now to a heat flow. T delta S itself is in energy, but by converting it through multi multiplying by the current divided by Faraday's constant, we convert that to a uh, joules per second or a uh, thermal power. And now the um, polarization term or the factoring in the resistance of the cell is given by the product of the current applied to the cell squared times the resistance and that's also uh, stated here. So W sub cal is a thermal power measurable in the calorimeter at this point. All right, so continuing on about the resistance of the cell, and this is a big component of the measuring of the heat that you'll measure in a cell when you're, um, when you're doing work with the cell outside of the calorimeter, cycling it, discharging it. The resistance of the cell is determined by using the cell polarization nu. And that's the difference between the cell's equilibrium open circuit potential and the voltage under load. So imagine the battery is sitting, uh, doing nothing for, say, 24 hours, and we measure its open circuit voltage. It's just a voltage measurement. And then we apply a current to it. That voltage changes, goes to some other level. That's V sub I. So nu, then, is equal to the rest potential, V open circuit, minus the voltage under load. So cell polarization nu has the units of volts, and the term I squared R then becomes the current times nu, which is in watts. So now we have this expression so far. The heat flow from the calorimeter uh, that we're measuring in the calorimeter comes from the T delta S term plus the polarization term, which is I times nu, typically. Um, just a word about this, though, to factor in some complications. So imagine you have a battery and you collect the battery voltage curve, and that means you're plotting the voltage versus the capacity of the battery. And if that voltage curve is very flat, this works pretty well, because at any point along the discharge curve, I can stop the current, and theoretically, the open circuit voltage will return to where it started, VOCV. Start it up again, goes to the load voltage, runs down the voltage curve, stop it, it comes back again. That works fine as long as your voltage curve is flat, but if it isn't flat, like many lithium-ion batteries, if I did that same plot of a lithium-ion battery, as I pass charge through the battery, change its state of charge, the open circuit voltage changes. So using this expression here can, be, uh, can put you in error if you're just interrupting the cell and recording the open circuit voltage with no current. 
and I'll show you how to handle that. So in our case, though, as I said at the beginning, we're most interested in detecting the side reactions in a cell, which may have a number of origins. So we're most often not interested in collecting what, what the entropy terms are, and we're most often not interested in knowing about the polarization term. What we want to know about are these reactions that degrade the capacity, cycle life, and, cal uh, and calendar life of the battery. So recognizing, though, that there may be multiple side reactions, and some will lead to capacity fade, and some may not. So there may be reactions going on in the battery that do not degrade the battery. But for sure, there will be reactions in the battery that do degrade it, all of which, however, will have a reaction enthalpy, delta H, associated with them. Now, for the present case, we'll just consider these parasitic reactions to be irreversible and not producing any reversible work. So the heat generated by these reactions, which we'll just lump into one pile, expressed as a thermal power and representing multiple possible reactions, is given here. So I could have a number of things going on in this battery, uh, and I'm just going to represent that thermal power from all these side reactions by an expression like this, where delta H1 is one reaction, the second reaction, and then the nth reaction. <clears throat> so the complete thermal power expression then becomes as shown here, the thermal power we measure in the calorimeter, the entropy term, the polarization term, and then the term from all the sources of heat that flow in the battery, or parasitic uh, reactions that take place in the battery. So we can simplify that, so the expression or variance of it, which you'll see more than once here, is the heat flow measured in the calorimeter is equal to the thermal power of the entropy term, the thermal power of the polarization term, and the thermal power from parasitics. All right, so that applies to when you're doing electrochemical measurements in a cell, um, cycling, discharging a battery. Uh, all the preceding concepts uh, apply to situations which, where current is passed in the cell. Recognize, though, that uh, several hours to, say, a day are required for a, a previously polarized cell to fully relax, to let all these gradients relax. The thermal power measured under open circuit conditions, so you're measuring an open circuit uh, heat flow right now, that thermal power you measure does not include T delta, T delta S, and it does not include the uh, heat from polarization. Thermal power produced in an open circuit measurement um, is just from the various parasitic and non-parasitic processes. Processes, uh, parasitic processes can conclude a number of things that do not lead to capacity loss. Let's say your, your container or some part of the external part of the container has um, a moisture sensitivity. It absorbs moisture. It desorbs moisture. As it's equilibrating with the moisture in the calorimeter and the battery was different outside, had picked up some water, you bring it in the calorimeter, you're going to see that heat flow from moisture moving in and out of that coating. If there's a sealant on the battery, and that sealant is not completely quiet reaction-wise, if there's a little bit of cure going on in that sealant, you will measure the reaction of that continuing cure. Uh, and we've seen that lots of times. It can be confusing where these heat flows come from. Uh, minor levels of electrolyte reactions that don't necessarily degrade the capacity. For example, in a lithium-ion battery, uh, you always put the battery together, and it's going to have some moisture in the, um, in the electrolyte, and that may be 15 to 20 parts per million water. And when the salt is combined with that, there's a low level of hydrolysis that will go on, and that produces heat. And that does not necessarily degrade the capacity of the battery. So um, the open circuit measurement can give you a lot of information, but it seems to me you have to have a lot of pre-information before you can follow and, and use the heat flow that you're measuring in the calorimeter with just an open circuit measurement. Um, furthermore, current passage, actually running the battery, can change these parasitic reactions that degrade the capacity. So if the battery's sitting very quiet, it may not be losing capacity or, or the shelf life might, might be very good. Start the battery up and run it again to do energy and you can now accelerate those parasitic reactions that were not taking place and it was just sitting there. 
For example, um, a lot of batteries have passivation layers that form on them, like a metallic lithium surface. Allow a metallic lithium surface in a battery to sit for a while, and it forms a passive layer on the, front, on the top of it. It becomes quiet. And if you look at the calorimetric response, it just exponentially decays. Now start that battery up again, and you start plating or stripping lithium off of it. That passive layer is disrupted, and now you have fresh lithium surfaces for which the electrolyte can react with again. And so you have this, this parasitic reaction that now is, is brought to the surface again, and you'll measure a much higher degra a degradation of uh, thermal power after you go open circuit. So uh, a lot of it depends on the, um, on, on the application you're using it for. All right, so let me move into recent methods for extracting reaction parasitics. So hopefully I've given you an indication of where all these parasitics come from, where all the heat in the calorimeter, all the measurements, the heat you measure in the calorimeter, where it comes from, and some insight in the, the complexity of some of these parasitic reactions. And so now what we're going to try to do is talk about how do you, how do you separate the entropic heat, the polarization heat, and be left with the, just the parasitic heats. Okay, so... Um, the top here is, a, is an expression uh, um, for sources of heat flow in a calorimeter. And it actually comes from two guys, Ross McKinnon and Jeff Don, uh, derived this equation a number of years ago. And it's identical to the equation that I already showed you, but it's, it's written in a little bit different form. Um, dQ dt is the thermal power that you measure in the calorimeter. Our entropic term is shown here on the, between the brackets. There's T delta S in the middle. The partial vessel with respect to X. So uh, this expression was written for a lithium, um, a, a lithium, rechargeable lithium battery. So lithium is on is the negative electrode, and the positive electrode is an intercalation material, an intercalation material like a lithium ion battery has. So X is, represents the degree of lithiation. So you're putting uh, you're putting in lithium in the intercalatant, or you're taking it out. And the change in the entropy with respect to X refers to the change in entropy with respect to the amount of lithium that is in or take, putting in the, in the positive electrode or withdrawn. Uh, therein lies a change in voltage, too, that I talked about. Uh, S sub zero refers to the metallic lithium electrode since it's in its, its uh, elemental state. We take that as equal to zero. Um, uh, N dx dt refers to the rate of change of intercalatant content. Essentially gives you uh, the ability to change the thermal power. Uh, I sub nu is the thermal power from all sources of overpotential, which is shown here. And the calorimeter baseline and parasitics are referred to in these two derivatives as well. So, uh, I, as I said, identical to the in, in content to what I showed already. Heat flow we measure from the calorimeter, the entropic term, um, the polarization term, and the uh, parasitic term. All right, so it describes the sources of heat completely. The problem now is how to separate the sources of heat flow. Uh, so our, our attack on this initially was rather than deal with the thermal power, we'll determine the thermal energy, and we'll arrive at the thermal energy by integration of this term. Okay, so what we do um, to accomplish that is I guess um, uh, first described as the equation we use to accomplish that separation. So basically, it, it, it takes this form. Uh, we cycle a battery. We charge a battery uh, all the way up to the top of charge, or to some charge limit we want to do to, and then we discharge a battery. So we do one full cycle. Um, dQ sub D and dQ C sub dT refer to the thermal power during charge and discharge respectively. So this term between the brackets here is the calorimetric response of one full cycle. So we'll record the heat flow from the calorimeter discharging the battery and charging the battery, and that's that term here. Um, the second bracketed term is the voltage curve hysteresis cor corresponding to the same cycle. So while we're doing this in the calorimeter, we're recording the voltage, the current, and the time and all that data is expressed in this bracketed term. And I'll show this graphically so that it becomes very easy to see what we're doing. Importantly, when integration is done reversibly, heat, reversible heating drops out. So 
any entropy term, which, are, which is a reversible heating, if we charge the battery and we get a reversible T delta S, let's say that's exothermic, we turn it around and discharge the battery, that same term is going to be endothermic. And so by integrating over one full cycle, the entropy terms drop out. We don't have to worry about the entropy heating anymore. Um, completing a full cycle avoids having to determine VOCV. Now these are systems that the voltage curve is not flat. And by integrating the total voltage curve, we get the total polarization. Um, the vol total voltage curve, we get the total uh, polarization. So anything that hysteresis between the charge and discharge curve, which I'll show you next, um, that hysteresis curve, the area of that hysteresis curve represents all sources of polarization. Uh, so note, this method is dependent upon good coulombic efficiency. And it has to be at least, our, our condition is at least 99%. And if your battery system is less than 99%, that means you're losing, at 99% you're losing 1% of your capacity every cycle. That means your battery's gonna cycle 20 times before it's dead. So you got major problems even before you, you get that far. And looking at parasitics becomes uh, a task further down the road for when you, before you start uh, worrying about parasitics. Uh, this technique, as I'll show you, is especially enabled with high precision coulometry cycling to allow precise counting of electrons transferred. And that statement allows us to identify parasitics that rob the cell of capacity versus those that don't rob the cell of capacity. Okay, and so we refer to this method as the integration subtraction method for obvious reasons. All right, let me graphically show you what that means. So here's the equation I just showed you. Let's deal with the uh, um, polarization term, which is right here. So I, I grabbed this off the internet. I just was looking for a uh, voltage curve to uh, highlight what I mean by this integration subtraction. So the red is the cell's charging, discharging, and we have this area between the charge and discharge curve. That's the area we're after when we plot voltage versus um, capacity. Um, why that is so is if I were to take that same battery system and run it at an incredibly slow rate, say a thousand hours to charge it and a thousand hours to discharge it, so a total of two thousand hours, that voltage curve at that incredibly low rate would, 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 would run right down the middle, right between the charge and discharge voltage curve, and that would be essentially the open circuit voltage. So, but you're not gonna acquire that data. You're not gonna sit there and do 2,000 hours to acquire one open circuit voltage measurement for a battery. It's just not practical. So by, by uh, acquiring this data and then integrating to calculate the area between the curve, that gives us our total polarization. The uh, ionic resistance, the passivation layer resistances, the the um, resistances in the um, electrodes. All of it is lumped into that hysteresis. So that's the polarization term. The entropy term, or the heat term, is shown over here. And it goes like this. So this panel is the total thermal response from the calorimeter, from the TAM. Uh, we may charge the cell as so, and here are the, the actual um, thermal measurements. Right in the middle here, it goes from charge to discharge, and we go through it and we discharge it. Now to show you what happens here, if I take right in the middle, and I take the data to the right, and roll it back over on the left, which I've done down here, see the arrows, I come up like this, I go to my top of charge switch point, and I start discharging it, you see the arrows coming back. Notice how symmetrical that is? These are our entropy terms, and this is from graphite. These are entropy, entropy terms, which are very significant. You can't ignore these. Um, but you can see how they drop out, how they cancel one another, if we were to integrate this. Um, we were then left with, a, with an offset from zero, which is the sum of our polarization and our parasitic terms, okay? So that's how graphically it works, conceptually how the integration subtraction method works. All right, so we'll turn to full cells using this methodology. 
Uh, we use pouch cells quite a bit with a nominal capacity of 250 milliamp hours. Um, I talked about the experimental uh, modifications. I explained, hopefully, what the integration subtraction method is. And now we're going to talk about voltage segments to determine cell voltage parasitics. So I just took this one example to show how this technique works and the information you get out of it with respect to the charge, to the state of charge of a lithium ion battery. And of course, this is the objective to determine the parasitics as a function of state of charge and a reference where this, occur, uh, this appears. All right, so the cell is uh, artificial graphite as the negative electrode with a high voltage lithiated cobalt oxide as a positive electrode. Very standard uh, lithium ion cell. And here's the total voltage curve in blue up here. Um, we're going to we're going to take this total vert voltage curve and take bite-sized bits of it, voltage segment cycling. So example, and I think the best way is to show you on the next slide. Um, we're going to take bites of it. So we're going to first cycle between 3 and 3.8 volts. And in this panel here, this is the total voltage curve, and the highlighted region is the voltage that we're measuring from 3 to 3.8 volts. In the green is the total calorimetric response for a full cycle. And in the highlighted area here is the calorimetric response for just 3 to 3.8 volts. So we're going to do this, take that data, dump it into our automated uh, integration subtraction method, and this, this app we have will spit out the parasitics, the parasitic thermal energy and the parasitic thermal power for the voltage range between 3 and 3.8. Then we'll go up to 3.7 to 3.9. Here's the voltage for 3.7 to 3.9. Here's the calorimetric response for 3.7 to 3.9. Now remember, these calorimetric responses have entropy changes from the negative electron, and they have entropy changes from the positive electron, which in a lithium ion battery are significant because there's, there's often phase changes that take place in a lithium ion battery that don't take place in a lot of other batteries. All right, and then 3.8 to 4, you see that voltage segment, the um, calorimetric response. And then finally, at the top of charge, 4.1 to 4.3, right there, here's our, our heat flow response. We'll take all that data, put it into our app, and this is what we get. Um, on the top panel here, we get the parasitics in microwatts. Um, what we've done here, I have to back up a second here, we have uh, four cells that we're measuring. We always run sister cells. So if we're going to do an experiment, we always run a duplicate. Um, we start, this refers to the electrolyte in this battery. The battery is three parts ethylene carbonate and seven parts ethyl methyl carbonate. A very vanilla, very standard um, baseline uh, lithium ion battery light. There's no additive. The second Paracells, same vanilla baseline electrolyte, three parts ethylene carbonate, seven parts ethyl methyl carbonate, but this paracells contains two weight percent vinylene carbonate, a very well known additive uh, that occurs, that's found in many, many, if not all, lithium ion batteries. Um, all right, so here is the pair of vanilla electrolytes. You can see the parasitics, we're plotting this against the average voltage calculated from those uh, bite-sized pieces of voltage curve. You can see the parasitics at uh, low states of charge, fairly low, not too much different than the control. But as we move up the voltage curve, get to higher, higher average voltage, note how the parasitics get very large. Now are those from cell robbing reactions or are they from, you know, stuff we don't understand. Well, this is where counting the electrons really comes in using coulometry methods. Down here is the coulombic inefficiency. So it's one minus the coulombic efficiency. So what happens to the coulombic inefficiency as we go up there? And again, this data is collected simultaneously. You can see that the coulombic inefficiency goes up. So there's a there's a, a, a direct correlation to the number of electrons lost, which is indicated by increasing columbic inefficiency and the increase in parasitics. 
So this heat flow here that's much greater than the one with the additive is correlated with a lot more electrons lost. And, and we can work out that, that relationship exactly. But just qualitatively, you can understand we're losing a lot of electrons. We're losing capacity while we're, while we're recording much higher levels of heat. So this heat flow here is definitely due to reactions that are robbing the cell of capacity um, and can also affect calendar life and shelf life of the battery as well. But if you look at the cell with 2 weight percent of the additive in it, notice how much smaller the parasitics are relative to these. And you can see the correlation with the number of electrons lost. So we have much better coulombic inefficiency, which correlates with the much lower levels of um, uh, thermal parasitics. So uh, a very nice explanation for what uh, vinyl and carbonate actually does in, a, in, in the sense of how it controls cycle life in a battery and how important it is for a cycle life in a battery. All right, um, symmetric cells. So basically what, what I've shown you is this is how we analyze, it's kind of a standard way we will analyze an electrolyte formulation uh, with respect to its ability to produce a very long cycle life uh, battery. Um, symmetric cells is something a little bit different. It can be also very, very useful in developing electrolyte chemistry. And what I'm going to talk about um, are symmetric cells of uh, two different materials, actually three different materials. These two materials are graphite. This is a synthetic flake graphite, SFG44. It's a 44 micron flake graphite. And it has a surface area measured by BET as 8 square meters per gram. And another type of uh, um, artificial graphite, massively, I think MAGI stands for Massively Active Graphitic Electrode. And uh, it's another graphite electrode, and, but it has much smaller surface area, three square meters per gram. And then a third electrode, which is the titanate, Li5Ti4012. Now this is a very interesting electrode. Uh, batteries, lithium-ion batteries made with this negative electrode compared to graphite are far more stable than the graphite electrodes. Uh, I've seen examples of these will, these will cycle 10,000 times without any capacity loss. They're very stable, very stable batteries. But the problem and why you don't see that in, in commercial applications much um, is the following. Graphite has a, has a potential within 50 or 75 millivolts of metallic lithium. The titanate electrode is, uh, I think it's up, as I recall, up around one volt positive of metallic lithium. So if I build a full lithium ion cell from graphite, I'll have an average voltage of 3.75 volts. If I build one out of the titanate, now it's like two and a half volts. So I lose a huge amount of voltage by using the titanate, and therefore I lose a huge amount of energy. So it becomes a question. You, you employ lithium-ion batteries because of their energy density, and when you go to a very stable negative electrode like a titanate, you lose a lot of energy density. But it's an interesting electrode just for the, um, the exercise of seeing what that does, how that reacts with electrolytes in a calorimeter measurement. So all these experiments are done at 40C at a C over 10 rate. There's no trickles and no rest periods, and here's a reference where that work appears. All right, what is the symmetric cell? So we have two coin cells. One, two. <laughs> One cell we lithiate and delithiate. That means we put lithium into the graphite. The coin cells, one side of the coin cell is graphite, the other side is a metallic lithium foil. So we, um, we discharge that cell, we put lithium into the graphite, and then we take it out. The next cell, the other cell, we just put lithium in and we leave it in. So we have two coin cells with graphite with no lithium in it and graphite with lithium in it. We take the coin cells apart, take the graphite electrodes, make another coin cell. So now we have one coin cell, graphite on one side, no lithium in it, and the graphite on the other side has all the lithium in it. And now what we're going to do is just move, we're just going to shift the lithium back and forth between the two graphites. And by doing this, we eliminate the positive electrode. So we eliminate all the potential reactions that can take place at the positive electrode, 
and focus our attentions now on the symmetric cell, on the graphite cell. Here's a voltage curve of the symmetric cell. Uh, we have one electrode is fully lithiated here, and the down here the other electrode is fully lithiated. And here's a um, calorimetric response of it, showing the symmetry of the system, um, and the uh, calorimetric response. On the right here is the uh, thermal energy. Now in this piece of work, we did not deal with thermal power. We measure the thermal power, but then through our integration subtraction technique, we convert that to thermal energy. And I'm represent representing this as the thermal energy in millijoules per milliamp hour of capacity passed. So here is the high surface area graphite. Uh, notice it's, it's consistently higher in thermal energy and, and thermal energy than the low surface area of graphite. Now if I come over here and look at my coulombic efficiency, it should be correlated if the differences in thermal power are correlated with capacity loss. And indeed they are. But now I'm plotting coulombic efficiency, not inefficiency. So the trends should be inversely, um, should be inversely related when I'm, when I'm comparing coulombic efficiency versus uh, the heat flow data. So you can see the SFG44 has lower columbic efficiency. I would expect higher thermal parasitics, which I see. And the MAG E, of course, has better columbic efficiency, should have lower uh, thermal parasitics, which indeed it does. Now for kicks, we also ran uh, a coin cell with lithium on the negative side and MAG E, uh, the graphite. So this is a coin cell where we're cycling lithium between, so we're plating lithium on metallic lithium, and then we're putting it into the graphite. Uh, the major point is that rather than a symmetric cell, it is actually a lithium graphite cell. And notice the thermal power is much higher than the symmetric cells, and that's because we have metallic lithium in the cell. And that in itself has its own issues with uh, parasitic cell reactions. And then the titanate. Look at the titanate, almost no measurable parasitics. So um, again, it shows that the technique can measure zero parasitics, right? You'd like, it's nice to see that, that there are some systems that have zero parasitics. And if you look at the climic efficiency, as expected, the climic efficiency is almost perfect. So this is kind of a, a nice validation of the methodology we use, that if indeed we do get uh, almost perfect climic efficiency, and <coughs> and in this case, the parasitics are almost zero, so uh, um, a good validation of it. To show that this data actually has some meaning just to what a user would use, would find in the cell, uh, we wanted to just check the, uh, the capacity fade. The, the cells that have uh, greater thermal uh, parasitics, higher levels of thermal parasitics should should degrade faster, and that's indeed what we find. The SFG, the high surface area graphite, has a slope of, uh, it loses 3.1 milliamp hours per cycle, where the lower surface area graphite loses only 2.4 milliamp hours per cycle, and um, the LTO is, is indeed very, very flat. All right, uh, so what else can we learn from the apparent success of measuring the heat or reaction? Now remember, we're taking all that data from the symmetric cells and we're using it in the context in the sense of thermal energy, so we can talk about reaction heats. Uh, if this is true, there should be a relationship between the lithium consumed and the parasitic energy. And indeed there is. So if I plot, well, I should stick to the script here, from the columbic efficiency and parasitic thermal energy, we can calculate a reaction enthalpy from the reactions of the electrode and the electrolyte. These, plot, these types of plots can give a lot of information on the cycle life failure mechanisms, the rate of lithium loss, and also be useful for open circuit measurements. So once I have this type of data, my open circuit measurement can, can I can take that data and use it and do something with it. But what we've done is to take the um, thermal, thermal energy produced um, by cycling the battery and plotting that against the number of micromoles of lithium lost. And you can see we get a nice straight line. And that straight line is the, uh, what I call a reaction composite, uh, reaction enthalpy of the composite parasitics. So I know that there's probably a reaction enthalpy, a degradation mechanism for EC reacting with the electrodes. 
and I know there's one for probably EMC reacting with the electrode. So I can't ferret, I can't separate those two individual reactions, but I can get a, um, um, a composite or, or maybe an average reaction enthalpy for the reaction of those electrolytes with graphite electrodes. All right, at the end here now, summary. From the first law of thermodynamics, which I've already uh, discussed with you, all the information we can obtain from a heat flow battery, a heat flow measurement is contained in the term Q. The heat measured Q contains, in addition to the parasitic information, which is what we're after, it has the entropic information and cell polarization information. And by the use of the integration subtraction method, all the components of Q can be separated. The cell parasitics rob the cell of energy can be confirmed through the use of high precision colometry measurements. With the rechargeable cell, electrolyte chemistry can then be readily explored and optimized. And the use of symmetric cells, where possible, um, are, an, are a nice way of isolating which electrode is giving you the biggest problem along the investigation of electrolyte as a function of, elect of, uh, of electrode identity. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Hopefully it made some sense. And, it, and if you're pursuing these measurements in a heat flow calorimeter, it's, uh, it's, it should be useful background. Okay, thanks everybody for listening. Um, what we're going to do is go ahead and open up to the question and answer session. And we'll start with um, just a first question here. And that was, at one point, Larry, you'd mentioned that the tests were done at 40 degrees C. Are there alternative temperatures that you'd recommend for this kind of testing? Why 40 degrees C? Um, can you go too high in a temperature and then not extrapolate back to room temp? Uh, so just really a question of what temperature do you suggest running these studies at? Why at that temperature? And what alternative temperatures would you recommend? <laughs> okay, Colette, um, uh, this is Larry. Uh, we generally, by practice, um, set the calorimeter at somewhere above uh, room temperature. Uh, it's just a much more stable situation. And uh, 40 degrees C is, is, is to us a good compromise because it, um, it will accelerate aging and uh, gives one a better sense of stressing the battery, but not too much. So lithium ion battery uh, will generate uh, substantially more parasitic reaction heat the higher the temperature is, and that's why uh, your iPhone will typically shut off once the temperature reaches a certain level. So uh, 40 degrees C has always worked well for us. We have run at higher temperatures, and you, did, you definitely see a higher level of parasitic uh, thermal power uh, the, higher energy temper the higher temperature you use. In, in a lot of cases, the calorimeter, um, the calorimeters will, will obtain um, the initial baseline taken at a lower temperature and raised to a higher temperature. So one can often get uh, kinetic information by starting at, say, 30 degrees C and then moving up 2 or 3 degrees C per step while maintaining uh, a fixed voltage, for example. That would be more like an open circuit measurement, but we've done that as well, too. And in that case, one has to be very careful that the particular calorimeter is um, maintaining the baseline uh, set at the initial experiment and doesn't drift as you move up to higher temperatures, which is possible. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, and kinetic information as well. So that's great. Thermal and, you know, how, how stable and how fast. So the two tenets of chemistry. Great. All right. Uh, so the next question that came in was, um, are there similar methods that can be employed for capacitors? So you talked about resistors. What about capacitors? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I, I've never used, I've never done any measurements on capacitors. Um, I would see no reason why. I know that a lot of um, high-energy capacitors, um, for instance, that might use small amounts of intercalation, uh, so-called supercaps, um, their electrolyte reactivity is, is also a significant question, as well as the quality of the graphite or the quality of the um, high-surface area carbon you're using. So, 
Um, I, I think it's a it's a legitimate, very legitimate way to approach uh, capacitor stability, particularly at uh, at, at high states of charge. Um, capacitor is fully charged and uh, measuring the uh, parasitic heat flow. So I, I think it would it would be a, a, a very useful. Uh, method to assess the electrolyte stability of uh, various capacitor or electrolyte formulations. Okay, great. Yeah, maybe uh, this uh, this questioner or this person that asked the question, they found a, a growing field for calorimetry. So that's great, a, a new application based on this initial work. So um, let's see, I think we have time for two more questions uh, just to keep in consideration of time. And one is, so lithium ion batteries very popular, Nobel Prize was just awarded for some research, but what other materials do you think where people are going? You talked a little bit about the other, um, you talked a little bit of electrolytes, additives, but how about you know next generation batteries? W what are your thoughts on that? Kind of an open-ended question. Um, right, so um, specifically what we, what we did quite a bit of work on was uh, the use of silicon in the, uh, in lithium ion batteries, and typically that's used or attempted to use um, uh, reasonably small amounts of, of uh, silicon in the graphitic electrode. And there's been a whole lot of, uh, of, of work done to try to include silicon in the electrode formulation because it can lead to higher energy density. Um, so we did a lot of work on that, and the calorimetry was particularly useful for us because we we were able to um, understand the failure mechanisms in a um, silicon material that was uh, essentially based upon elemental silicon. Uh, in that, we saw numerous examples of uh, the lack of correlation between uh, decreasing columbic efficiency and uh, the calorimetric response, meaning that there are places in the voltage curve, um, places in the in the lithiation of silicon that are not associated with parasitic reactions, but yet give poor coulombic efficiency. So we're able to understand the failure mechanism of silicon quite a bit better in in the use of uh, in the use of silicon and. We also saw that, uh, by and large, the failure mechanisms using silicon materials that were largely or essentially just um, uh, elemental silicon, that the um, failure mechanism is, is an enormous swelling, an enormous increase in the surface area of, uh, of silicon, leading to uh, very high parasitic cell reactions that, that can be uh, managed with uh, appropriate electrolyte chemistry, so it gave us a lot of hope that the materials we were developing at 3M um, could eventually be managed by appropriate uh, electrolyte chemistry. So, uh, under uh, new materials are are, are particularly useful uh, to investigating calorimetry because, when used with uh, high precision uh, cycling equipment, can can um, lead to a much more rapid understanding of whether failure mechanisms are material-related or electrolyte-related. Okay. All right, well, we'll just finish off with one last question, and that is, it's kind of along the same lines, and that's a question about the, and I'm sorry if I'm saying this wrong, the, the vinylene carbonate, so that 2% additive that you added that controls the life cycle in the battery. Um, just if you could comment a little bit more of, of how it actually works on just a very surface level. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, you could, uh, honestly, you could, you could find multiple uh, research articles on the function of these various uh, additives like vinylene carbonate or um, uh, fluorinated ethylene carbonate. But one, one, theme that seems to arise from all that um, R&D on, uh, on the exact mechanism for the uh, consumption of uh, vinylene carbonate, by the way, which is consumed during cycling, is that it ultimately leads to um, uh, carbonates that form during the 
reduction of vinyl and carbonate at the negative electrode. And the, the carbonates, different types of carbonates, one of which is lithium carbonate, can um, can form a very, very passive layer at the surface of uh, the graphitic electrode and therefore uh, attenuate subsequent reactions uh, at the graphitic surface. So those mechanisms, uh, fluoroethylene carbonate and vinyl carbonate, have largely been correlated with the formation of um, uh, carbonates and oxides at the surface of the graphitic electrodes. But as I said, there are uh, multiple papers that uh, that uh, are either calculations or spectroscopic investigations that try to understand the exact mechanism for the uh, for the function of these different types of uh, uh, electrode materials, uh, electrolyte additives. Okay. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was actually uh, consumed during the process as well. Um, you know, so I guess leading to degradation of the the efficacy of the battery then also with that degradation. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Okay. Neat. All right. Well, that's those are that's all we have time for for questions. Um, those of you that are listening, if we didn't get to your question, we'll make sure that we follow up via email with you. And um, if you would, before logging off, um, please make sure that you take the post-webinar survey. We do appreciate that, and we appreciate your time today. Thanks. <laughs>